William Tecumseh Sherman might have been America's most influential general when it comes to lasting legacies. War was always horrible but in the early modern era, there was a belief or at least hope that it could be limited to rival armies, with civilians left out of it. Then came the U.S. Civil War and Sherman, who rubbished such notions as non-existent in the context of modern warfare. He advocated and demonstrated the effectiveness of what he termed hard war, which later generations named total war. Below are 20 things about that, and other generals who shaped military history. The American General Who Fathered Modern Total War On September 2, 1864, after a hard-fought summer campaign followed by a hard-fought siege, Union troops led by General William Tecumseh Sherman entered Atlanta, Georgia, the conquest of that key Confederate city, known as the Gateway to the South, saved President Abraham Lincoln from what seemed like inevitable defeat in that fall's election. It ensured the continuation of a federal administration committed to fighting out the Civil War until final victory. Everybody expected that Sherman would garrison the city, then head north to Virginia to help Ulysses S. Grant, who was stalemated against Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. The victor of Atlanta had other plans though. Early in the war the Union followed a conciliatory policy, it fought a relatively limited war on the assumption that, most in the Confederacy, had not supported secession, and that their state's governments were illegal, and unrepresentative of the popular will. So Union forces leaned over backward to gently treat Southern civilians and their property including those hostile towards the Union. By 1862 attitudes had changed. Pragmatists began to advocate for hard war, and directed severity against secessionists, and Sherman emerged as a key proponent of that hard line, in 1864 he revolutionized modern warfare and transformed hard war notions into total war that targeted not only enemy armies, but also civilians who supported those armies. A 19th century scorched earth campaign By the autumn of 1864, the Civil War had dragged on for more than three bloody years, with a horrendous and steadily mounting toll in blood and treasure, both the Union Army's commander, Lt. General Ulysses S. Grant, and his friend General William T. Sherman realized that the conflict could only end if the Confederacy lost its ability to wage war. So Sherman planned an operation comparable in broad outline to modern scorched earth campaigns. He and his army would strike out from Atlanta and march along a broad front across the heart of Georgia. They would live off the land and destroy all infrastructure in their path that was useful to the Confederate war effort. 62,000 bluecoats marched out of Atlanta which they left a smoldering ruin. They then divided into two columns, abandoned their supply lines and plunged into the Peach State. As Sherman put it he wanted to make Georgia howl, and how it did. Union forces advanced along a 60-mile front, wrecked military targets along the way, destroyed industry and infrastructure, lived off the land, and against Sherman's orders looted civilian property. It conclusively demonstrated that the Confederacy was a hollow shell, incapable of protecting its heartland or citizens. The long-lasting legacy of Sherman's marches through Georgia and the Carolinas. General William T. Sherman was not a cruel man, but he certainly believed in cruel war, as he put it. War is cruelty and you cannot refine it. The crueler it is the sooner it will be over. He did not coin the phrase total war, its first use can be traced to the 1930s. However, he birthed the concept of modern total war. He wrote in a letter dated December 24, 1864, that the Union found itself in a situation where it was, not only fighting hostile armies but a hostile people, and must make old and young rich and poor, feel the hard hand of war as well as their organized armies. His destructive march through Georgia was followed by an even more destructive march through South and North Carolina. Sherman's marches left a legacy that lasted long after the Civil War, not only in the memories of aggrieved Southerners, but in modern military science. The morality of the destruction wrought by Sherman has long been debated, but few contest its effectiveness. In subsequent major conflicts such as the First and Second World Wars, combatants took it for granted that they faced not only enemy armies, but also the civilian infrastructure and population that supported them. U.S. Air Force General Curtis LeMay updated the concept in 1949, when he defined total war in the nuclear age as an overwhelming atomic strike that could go so far as killing a nation. The badass general who invented basic battlefield tactics. Millennia before William T. Sherman, war broke out in 378 BC between the ancient Greek city states of Thebes and Sparta. The Thebans had their work cut out for them. 
Other Greek city-states staffed their phalanxes with citizen soldiers civilians who temporarily took up arms in wartime. By contrast Sparta's citizens were professional soldiers. They began to prepare for a lifelong martial career at age seven in a brutal military academy, and spent the rest of their lives training for war. Sparta could afford that because of massive slavery. It conquered its Messenian neighbors in the 8th century BC, then turned the entire Messenian population into state slaves known as helots. To control the helots, who outnumbered the Spartans 10 to 1, Sparta became a military state and society. It also became a police state, with a secret security force known as the Crypta that terrorized the helots, and killed any who seemed restive or showed leadership potential. It was Lebensraum Ritzmal the Nazis actually drew upon Sparta, when they planned their conquest of Eastern Europe the locals were to be enslaved to toil for the master race. The decks seemed to be stacked overwhelmingly in favor of the Spartans, but fortunately for the Thebans, they had a badass general Epaminondas. As seen below he countered Spartan superiority by inventing basic battlefield maneuver tactics. The Greek commander who deliberately sought to take the scary Spartans head on. The end result of the Spartans' constant drill and training was an elite Spartan phalanx unmatched anywhere in the world for discipline and toughness. By the 4th century BC, Sparta was Greece's preeminent power, and the Spartan phalanx was one that nobody wanted a piece of. That is until Epaminanda showed up, and broke the spell of Spartan invincibility, when he broke the Spartans at the Battle of Lectra in 371 BC. That the Theban general led an army of 7,000 hoplites, plus 600 cavalry, against a bigger Spartan army of 10,000 hoplites, plus 1,000 cavalry. The Theban phalanx was spearheaded by an elite unit of 300 warriors known as the Sacred Band, comprised of 150 pairs of homosexual lovers. The Spartan elite was a unit of 1,000 full Spartan citizens, who had trained for war since childhood. The Greek norm was to place the best troops at the right side of their line. As such it was rare for the best troops of both armies to face each other. Epaminondas changed that when he put his best troops on the left side of his line, directly opposite the Spartans. Then as seen below he introduced two innovations that revolutionized warfare. The Theban general who shattered Sparta. Epaminondas' first innovation was to depart from the norm of a formation, with lines of a uniform depth usually 8 to 12 men deep in Greek hoplite warfare back then, instead the Theban general stacked the left side of his line 50 deep by thinning the rest of his formation. That is he concentrated force at the decisive point. His second innovation was to not follow the usual script and advance in line abreast, in which the entire formation hits the opposite formation simultaneously. Instead Epaminondas echeloned his army so that his powerful left was the first to reach the enemy, and his weak right was the last. The Spartan right, stacked 12 deep, shattered when it was struck by Epaminondas left, 50 deep, it lost 1,000 men, including 400 of the Spartan elite citizenry, and the Spartan king Cleombrotus I. The myth of Spartan invincibility never recovered. Epaminondas went on to invade Sparta, freed its helots and formed them into an independent state. Since its society and economy had depended on the slave labor of the helots, Sparta was forever reduced to minor player status. Thebes' great general died in 362 BC, killed in battle as he dealt Sparta yet another disastrous defeat. His innovations outlived him, and formed the bedrock of King Philip II of Macedon's military principles, and those of his son Alexander the Great. The badass general who built on Epaminondas innovations and professionalized warfare. While Thebes and Sparta vied for the position of top dog in the ancient Greek world, a new power was rising in the north that would soon eclipse both. In 359 BC a 23-year-old Philip II ascended the throne of Macedon. Within two decades, he would demonstrate his chops as a general to such an extent that neither Greece, nor warfare would ever be the same again. It shocked the Greeks, who viewed Macedon as a barely civilized kingdom that spoke a barely intelligible Greek dialect. That, despite the fact that Macedon had plenty of potential, both in manpower and resources that far exceeded those of any Greek city-state. Philip unified the fractious Macedonian tribes, and transformed them into the world's most respected and feared military machine, he made soldiery a full-time job and highly paid professional occupation. That allowed him to drill his men regularly and ensure their discipline and unit cohesion. Epaminondas had impressed Philip, and he built on the deep phalanx innovations of the Theban general. He improved upon them when he armed his Macedonians with a long spear the Sarisa. Philip also reduced his men's armor, 
and gave them smaller and lighter shields to increase their mobility, that enabled them to march at speeds that few other armies could equal. The man who formed and trained the ancient world's most formidable army. Philip II also made Macedon's cavalry the world's best, when he recruited the sons of the nobility into what came to be known as the Companion Cavalry, he equipped them with long lances, that gave them greater reach than their opponents, and trained them in shock tactics. To break enemy lines, Philip taught the Companion Cavalry to ride in wedge formations, that were well suited to penetrate enemy lines, and were also more maneuverable than traditional formations, in which cavalry rode abreast. Another innovation was Philip's creation of a corps of engineers to design and build new instruments of war. The Macedonian monarch and general further revolutionized warfare, when he perfected the coordination of different types of troops in a battlefield synergy that enabled them to support each other, it was the birth of combined arms tactics. Philip's heavy infantry, light infantry skirmishers, archers, slingers, cavalry, and engineers, all worked together. Their mutual support made their collective whole greater than the sum of their individual parts. His signature combined arms tactic came to be known as the hammer and anvil. In it, the infantry phalanx and the roll of the anvil fixed an enemy in place, then the cavalry closed in with shock tactics and acted as a hammer to shatter the foe. Philip's military machine was unstoppable and by 338 BC, he had mastered Greece. He then began preparations for his life's ambition, an invasion of the Persian Empire. However, just before he set out to conquer Persia, Philip was assassinated at a wedding. It would be his son, Alexander the Great, who would use Philip's military machine and tactics to become the ancient world's greatest general and conqueror. The Badass General Who Perfected Battlefield Tactics The Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca elevated the role of strategy in warfare, he led a motley and multinational army out of Spain, through southern France and across the Alps into Italy, and thus brought the Second Punic War to enemy territory. In Italy, Hannibal earned and cemented his reputation, as one of history's greatest military commanders. He accomplished that with his perfection of battlefield tactics that allowed him to consistently best bigger Roman armies. Hannibal inflicted a series of humiliating defeats upon the Romans, that shook Rome's hold on her Italian allies and client states, and many of them jumped ship and either joined Hannibal or declared neutrality. His greatest victory came in 216 BC, when the Romans amassed their biggest army to date, 87,000 men and marched off to crush the Carthaginian general. As seen below, he met them with 40,000 men at Cannae, and crushed them instead in a military masterpiece that is still studied as an example of the near-perfect battle. The Mark of a Great General The mark of a great general is his ability to get the most of what he has available, even if it is not the best or most ideal raw material. Hannibal's army was a mishmash of ethnic units of varied abilities. It functioned only because of Hannibal's ability to deploy each group so as to maximize its strengths, and minimize its weaknesses. A significant part of his army were Gaulish levies recruited from northern Italy. While brave they were not as professional as Hannibal's African infantry and Greek mercenaries. So at the Battle of Cannae, the Carthaginian general placed the Gauls in the center, in a formation that bulged outwards. To either side of the Gauls, Hannibal positioned his more professional African heavy infantry, on the flanks Hannibal positioned his cavalry. When combat commenced, Hannibal expected that the Gauls would be forced backward under relentless Roman pressure. Eventually the Gaulish formation which had started off bulging outwards, would bend and bulge inwards, and form a bull shape or sack. The confident Romans would send victory as their foe gave ground, and push into the sack. Once that happened, as seen below Hannibal knew he had them. The Perfect Battle in Hannibal's plan for the Battle of Cannae, once the Romans were in the sack, the African infantry positioned to the Gauls' sides would wheel inwards, and attack the Roman flanks, by then the Carthaginian cavalry would have defeated the Roman cavalry. It would then turn around and attack the enemy infantry's rear, and thus completely encircle the Romans. Things worked out exactly as the Carthaginian general had planned, and in a battle viewed as the gold standard for tactical generalship, the Romans were nearly wiped out. Only 10,000 out of 87,000 Romans escaped, and the rest were either slaughtered or captured. Alas for Hannibal, he had won a great victory but not the war, the Romans learned their lesson, and from then refused to take the Carthaginian general head on. They kept him bottled up in southern Italy for years, while they attacked Carthage on other fronts, seized its empire in Spain, and defeated its allies in Sicily. 
eventually Roman general Scipio Africanus led a counter-invasion against Carthage itself, and Hannibal was recalled to defend his homeland. There he lost the climactic battle of the war at Sama in 202 BC. He was eventually forced into exile, and took his own life circa 182 BC in Bithynia in today's Turkey, to avoid capture by the Romans. The Badass General Who Revolutionized Warfare with Firearms the invention of gunpowder revolutionized warfare, but it did not happen overnight, it took centuries before gunpowder weapons, first used in battle in the 14th century, came to dominate warfare in the 16th century. Cannons were the first to leave their mark in the late 15th century, when King Charles VIII of France invaded Italy. He used mobile artillery to breach castle walls up and down the Italian peninsula. Firearms held back by their slow rate of fire, took a bit longer to make their mark, when they did, it was thanks in no small part to Gonzalo Fernandez de Córdoba. A Spanish general known as El Gran Capitan, the Great Captain, the Córdoba revolutionized warfare, when he innovated tactics that enabled firearms to dominate battlefields forever after, firearms had been in use for centuries before Córdoba appeared on the scene. However, infantry armed with such weapons, were handicapped by their slow rate of fire. After the firearms were discharged they took considerable time to reload, long enough for enemy cavalry or even swift-footed infantry, to close in and chop up the firearms users before they managed to get off another shot. As seen below to Cordoba came up with a solution for that problem. An upset victory that changed warfare. Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba el Gran Capitan, solved the problem of firearms inordinately long reload times at the Battle of Cherignola in 1503, there he made liberal use of the arquebus, an early long-barreled firearm and arquebus irons. In that engagement, the Cordoba led an army of 6,300 men, whose numbers included 1,000 arquebus irons and 20 cannons. They faced a French army of 9,000 men, mostly heavy cavalry and elite Swiss pikemen, supported by 40 cannons. The Cordoba deployed his arquebus irons in a defensive position behind a ditch and field fortifications. He then waited for the French to attack, and they obliged. From behind his fortifications, the Spanish general won an upset victory, when his arquebusiers shot the attackers to pieces. Battlefields were dominated by firearms bearing infantry from then on. The Cordoba furthered that revolution with the invention of formations that allowed infantry equipped with firearms to operate without the benefit of fortifications. The result was the Tercio, a formation that combined pikemen with arquebusiers, that allowed the latter to shelter behind the pikes of the former while they reloaded their firearms. Spanish infantry in the Tercio formation went on to dominate European battlefields for the next century. The badass general who kicked off the modern military revolution. Maurice, Count of Nassau, became Prince of Orange and Stadtholder of the Dutch Republic from 1585 onwards. In his years in office, Maurice cemented his reputation as a great general. When he led his Protestant countrymen's fight for freedom from Catholic Spain, and secure the Dutch Republic's de facto independence. While at it he changed warfare when he implemented radical innovations in military strategy and tactics, and laid the foundations for what came to be known as the military revolution. Ever since he was a tot, Maurice had been fascinated by all things military such as ballistics, engineering and mathematics, a bookworm and history buff, he developed military theories that he was eager to put in practice. As soon as he was confirmed as Prince of Orange in 1585 at age 18, he proceeded to energetically implement his innovations. His first step was to reorganize the Dutch army. He then led it in what came to be known as the Ten Glory Years, in which he and his men captured vital fortresses and towns from the Spanish, that rounded out the borders of the Dutch Republic, and make it more defensible. The Man Who Learned From The Ancients the victories of Maurice of Nassau in the Ten Glory Years solidified the Dutch cause, and established his reputation as the era's greatest general, many commanders who rose to prominence in the Thirty Years' War, and the English Civil War a generation or two later, learned their military skills while they served under Maurice. At the heart of his reforms was an emphasis on drill, streamlining logistics and the simplification of battlefield tactics. He was an avid student of Roman and Byzantine military history. He read about the role of rigorous training in the success of Rome's legions, and drew lessons from classical authors such as Vegetius, Elian, Frontinus and Emperor Leo VI of Byzantium. Maurice pioneered the decentralization of units, he made his infantry more maneuverable and flexible by splitting large Spanish-style tercio regiments, of about 3,000 men each into smaller battalions of 580 men. 
He also simplified logistics when he reduced his artillery to just four basic calibers. In 1599 Maurice went a step further and had the entire army of the Dutch Republic, re-equipped with muskets of the same caliber and size. That greatly eased the lives of quartermasters. However as seen below, the bedrock of Maurice's reforms was drill and discipline. The innovations of this general changed the world beyond the battlefield. Maurice of Nassau trained his men constantly, and introduced drills to reduce tasks such as loading, and discharging cannons or firearms to rote, the routine motions became operations that were, literally done by the numbers. That allowed soldiers to function in the heat and chaos of battle, and perform their jobs by falling back on muscle memory from repetitive drills. That system of discipline and drill became the model for European armies for centuries to come. Maurice's military revolution had knock-on effects that went beyond the military. The new way of war relied on high levels of training, expertise, discipline and organization, that could only be provided by professional, full-time soldiers who had to be maintained even in peacetime. That made soldiers far more expensive than they had been in earlier armies, before soldiers were cobbled together from hastily recruited and hastily trained conscripts, who were discharged soon as the war was over. The pay of the new permanent armies required higher taxes, and that in turn required an expansion in the authority and administrative machinery of governments, Gone were the days when fractious aristocrats could successfully challenge the crown and raise armies from their retainers and peasants. Such ad hoc forces stood no chance against the central government's professional, drilled and trained armies. Only other governments could afford to raise, equip and pay standing armies of similar quality. The badass Swedish general whose template was followed for centuries. King Gustavus Adolphus II ruled Sweden from 1611 to 1632, during which time he transformed his kingdom into a great power, he reformed the Swedish army and introduced military innovations that emphasized linear tactics and the efficient use of combined arms. That made Sweden the premier military force in the Thirty Years' War, and revolutionized warfare by creating a model that was copied by military commanders for hundreds of years afterward. The Swedish monarch built upon the innovations of Maurice of Nassau, and simplified logistics with the standardization of his army's artillery and muskets. Like the Dutch general from whom he liberally borrowed, Gustavus Adolphus paid attention to drill and discipline, until his Swedes became Europe's most professional soldiers. The Swedish king went Maurice of Nassau won better when he cross-trained his men, such as teaching Swedish infantry and cavalry how to operate artillery pieces. That enabled them to serve as gunners at a pinch if their own artillerists fell in battle. Also if they captured enemy guns, they could immediately turn them on their foes. In like vein if the need arose, a killed cavalryman could be replaced by an infantryman or vice versa. A Swedish military model from the 1600s that is followed to this day. Although Maurice of Nassau had reformed the Dutch army, dense Spanish-style tercio formations remained the norm throughout the rest of Europe, Gustavus Adolphus adopted Maurice's smaller infantry battalions, and reduced their density to only five or six lines. That allowed most of the soldiers to participate in combat, by contrast because they were so densely packed together, only about half of a tercio soldiers could directly engage in their opponents, unless and until those in front of them were killed or wounded. The Swedish king also introduced artillery to the lower levels of command. Before Adolphus, artillery was centralized and controlled by the army commander, Adolphus equipped his regiments with light field pieces that could keep up with attacking infantry. That gave lower level commanders greater firepower in both defense and offense. Between the reduction of formation's density and the equipment of regiments with artillery, a Swedish brigade of about 1,300 men could pour out more firepower than a tercio of 3,000 men. Adolphus also trained his infantry to fire in volleys. He was innovative with cavalry as well and reintroduced shock tactics, when he trained his horsemen to charge enemy lines. As artillery softened up the opposition, Swedish infantry would advance halt a short distance from the enemy, fire a deadly volley from close range, then charge the reeling foes before they recovered. When the enemy broke or was about to break, the cavalry would be unleashed to finish him off. That combined arms model in which artillery, infantry and cavalry acted in conjunction, became the standard emulated by Western armies for centuries. The broad outline is still followed to this day. The badass general who revolutionized skilled battlefield maneuvers. King Frederick II ascended the Prussian throne in 1740. He became known as Frederick the Great, after he fought a series of wars that greatly expanded Prussia's territory, 
and transformed it from a minor power into a major one. Along the way he demonstrated that he was his generation's greatest general. Frederick reformed the Prussian army and introduced military innovations, particularly skilled battlefield tactics that revolutionized 18th-century European warfare. He emphasized tactical training and transformed Prussia's army into a well-oiled machine that could execute intricate battlefield maneuvers on the fly. That multiplied his forces' effectiveness and allowed them to frequently attack and defeat bigger opponents. Frederick's father, King Frederick William I, had been a martinet who devoted his life to the Prussian army and became known as the Soldier King. However, he lavished resources to create an army that looked great on the parade ground, not in the field of battle. An example was his Potsdam Regiment, known as the Potsdam Giants, which was composed of exceptionally tall and big men minimum height 6 foot 2 inches to join, and some stood at 7 feet tall or more. Frederick William's agents combed Europe in search of extra tall recruits, and kidnapped them if they did not willingly enlist. The soldier king liked nothing more than to spend hours drilling his giants on the parade ground. His son was markedly different to say the least. The Great Modernizer when Frederick II ascended the throne, he immediately disbanded his father's expensive Potsdam giants and redirected their budget to raise seven new regiments and 10,000 troops. As the kingdom's chief general, he modernized the Prussian army and emphasized not only drill and discipline, but also the training of officers. The resultant well-trained officer corps allowed Frederick to grant his subordinates greater autonomy to use their own initiative to further his overall plan. It would become a German military hallmark, Frederick also introduced annual maneuvers, in which the Prussian army tested out new formations and tactics. The Prussian army was relatively weak in cavalry and relied instead on infantry. Frederick's favorite unit was his 1st Guards Battalion, of about 1,000 men, which he used to test out new theories. He also used it as a military academy to train new officers, and as a refresher for officers he thought could use more training. His next favorite outfits were grenadier units, comprised of select soldiers with at least two years' experience in regular infantry battalions. The bulk of Frederick's army were musketeers in standard infantry regiments. His men carried about 55 pounds of equipment, and they routinely marched about 15 miles a day. 